Our scripture this evening is Jeremiah 17, first eight verses, especially the last four, and uh, called the gift of encouragement. Page 767 in the Bibles in our pews. <clears throat> Here's the word of the Lord for the Sunday night. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron with a point of diamond, it is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. While their children remember their altars and their asherim beside every green tree and on the high hills, on the mountains in the open country, your wealth and all your treasures I will give for spoil as the price of your high places for sin throughout your territory. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave you and I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know. For in my anger a fire is kindled and shall burn forever. Does that make sense so far? I'm not going to do the history of it, but um, if anybody wants a little explanation, just put your hand up and I'll try. Okay. So here's a little word of explanation. This is being addressed to Judah who had fallen into sin and the Lord is saying you are going to forfeit your inheritance. And your children see your hypocrisy, though you worship, they can see it. And you're going to find that when uh, I turn over the wealth of this land to your enemies, it will be the ransom. I gave you this land and you, you wrecked it by your unfaithfulness. So that's verse 4, you shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know. You see, so it's a real strong rebuke, which is part of encouragement. Now these four verses, or yeah, four, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes, for its leaves remain green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit." We're going to stop right there and uh, imagine you recognize Psalm 1 in verses 7 and 8, uh, declaring the blessing on the man who trusts in the Lord or woman like a tree planted by the water. Remember this morning talking about the water, living water, and uh, doesn't fear when the heat comes. So um, in these four verses, what Jeremiah does is the reverse of what Psalm 1 does. Psalm 1 starts with a blessing and then goes to the curse on the wicked. This one starts with a curse on the wicked and then comes to the blessing. And since the first four verses introduced this, you know that the one who is being spoken so sternly to here is the Lord's people who have been unfaithful. And he wants them to know exactly uh, what, what they're in for. So that's the overall structure. And we're going to talk about encouragement a, a, a little bit throughout. This is the, the gift of encouragement is one of the spiritual gifts, and some of you scored high on it. If I were to rate this congregation on encouragement, I'd give you like 90% <laughs> because I've received, and it, me and Ann both have received so many encouraging notes and words from you and prayers over the last several months. I think you're, I think you're good at it. <laughs> And I think that the gift is tremendously important for a congregation to have because it brings us into the Lord's presence and it does for us what the scripture does. You know, it, um, in 2 Timothy 3, uh, 16 talks about how the scripture is useful for teaching, for rebuke, reproach, for upbuilding so that you might be fully equipped. Those middle two words, rebuke and reproach, those are, you know, those are hard things to hear, the rebuke and the reproach. But that's what Jeremiah is giving here. He's giving them the, the rebuke and the reproach in the verses 4 and 5 and 6, I mean 5 and 6, 
and, and then holding out the promise of, of blessing, which is what we normally think of when we think of somebody who's encouraging. They're the person that we like. <laughs> they come alongside of us and listen to us. But sometimes they also speak a strong word into our lives. And we maybe don't like it at the time, but we need it. And in our more honest moments, we'll admit that. That was good. I needed that. So that's what he's doing here in verses uh, 5 and 6. Now, I don't know. I debated whether I should admit this. But um, once in a while, I'll watch Britain's Got Talent on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw a clip there that was so good for this verse. I gotta, I gotta tell you about it. Uh, it was a middle-aged guy who was on the on the platform. He's about my age, right? He had glasses, about like I do. He, he was on the platform by himself, like I am. He didn't even have a pulpit. And uh, but he was, I think, an Episcopalian. He had that collar. And he sang this song without any accompaniment, which I'm not going to do. <laughs> it was, he had a kind of a high voice, and I, I felt so embarrassed for him. And just kind of wondered what the church is looking like in the eyes of the world on this show. You know, because you know that audience, they're kind of raucous sometimes. And he just kept, he wasn't, you know, it didn't seem like anything bothered him. He just kept singing his song. And as you listened to it, it got better. It, it got stronger. It got into a registry where he could actually sing well. And it wasn't long, but by the end of it, you knew that he was singing about grace to someone who had fallen into some kind of addiction and depression and was discouraged. And uh, the theme that uh, he kept hitting was hold on, hang on. So finally, he got done. <laughs> and he just stood there. He didn't walk off the stage. Nobody clapped. <laughs> and that was embarrassing because everybody claps in those things. Finally, Simon Cowell, nasty Simon, stood up all by himself and he clapped. And the whole place, you know, kind of followed suit. As if to say, we want to give some encouragement to those who are struggling, those who are weak. Probably somebody that this uh, Anglican knows who he's, about whom he's singing. It was so touching to see that. So I decided, regardless what you think of me for watching Britain's Got Talent, <laughs> I was going to tell you about it anyway. Uh, and uh, you can tell me if you're utterly, utterly disappointed <laughs> in my viewing habits. I mean, I could be worse, right? <laughs> could be worse. All of that to introduce this section of four verses about encouragement, two about cursed, the cursed man, and two about the blessed man. Pretty easy. And the outline is the same for both parts. First, when you're talking about the cursed man, what, what is this? What, what does he do? Why does he do it? And what is his end? That's told to us in verses 5 and 6. And, you know, it's not like you might expect that this guy has two little horns and um, has 666 on his forehead. Uh, he's more like you're a garden variety sinner who can't keep from sinning, and he just keeps sinning and sinning and sinning. He's, you would say he's a moron. And he might not admit that, but that's basically what a hardened sinner is. They keep getting underpaid and they keep serving again and again and again. It's kind of like if those of you who go fishing, you know, you got a $200 worth of tackle in your tackle box, but this fish down there, he only bites on worms. You know, you, you could have saved yourself a lot of time and just threw a worm out and he'd keep biting on it. That's the way a sinner is. No, no discernment uh, when it comes to the payments of his behavior. But, um, Jeremiah talks about the sin of Judah not using fishing as an illustration, but a, but a tablet that is engraved, the tablet of their heart, and it's engraved, and it's engraved on the altar. So the sins, every time they're committed, they get carved into the, into the stone. When the person uh, goes to worship in those days, they would anoint the altar with the blood of the sacrifice, and it would run into those uh, etchings, and it would stand out. Not 
not the one that they say they're worshiping, but their sins would just stand out. And of course, their children would notice it and remember their altars and their asherim and all the idols of those days everywhere. They, he says they're everywhere. And therefore, they are going to reap the, the wages of sin. So it's a person, what he does is he's uh, totally self-focused, you see. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. He just um, makes flesh his strength. His heart turns away from the Lord. So he is self-focused. He is all about self-worship. He is self-righteous. You can't tell him a thing. But he's attracted to idols because idols seem to give him a little bit of an extension on his power. And he can maybe influence some things by worshiping and serving the idol. The psychologists call this giving in to peer pressure. This is what goes on all the time in our schools. You talk, you ask why uh, a kid in middle school needs a certain kind of tennis shoe or whatever. Well, it's because everybody else has it, right? Or a jacket, maybe in high school, you don't say a jacket, because everybody else has it. And he feels like he got, he's got to have it. Although, of course, mom and dad try to say, you don't got to have it. But, but he's driven by peer pressure, which the Bible calls the fear of man. The fear of man. And when man is big and God is small, you're off track. And whether you're a kid in school or an adult, you know, buying something very impressive to others, the question is, why, what makes you think you've got to impress them? Anyway, that's what the cursed man does. The cursed man trusts in man's achievements, man's potential, man's insight. He trusts in man's hard work. He's just like he stepped out of Genesis 11 into 2018. It's the same guy, just different language in different place. That's the cursed man. And I've been reading, um, Henry Kissinger wrote a book on China. You know, he was working on diplomacy to China and describing the Chinese mind when it comes to foreign policy. And they are, their, their official doctrine is much like this. They're always asking, and I'm afraid that our president has echoed it a little bit, but what's in it for me, you know? We'll just wait until things come around to our way of thinking, our point of view. That's why Chinese diplomats seem so patient. It's their whole uh, philosophy about it. But that's the, that's the level of the official um, doctrine, according to Kissinger, which is like Israel under King Saul. When King Saul was uh, in power, and the Lord gave him a victory. He didn't follow through, you remember, and didn't sacrifice the animals that the Lord said to sacrifice. And so when Samuel came up and, you know, he's going to give him a word of encouragement <laughs> by way of rebuke, says, why didn't you do that? King Saul says, I was afraid of the people. Well, there he's spelling it right out. I was fear of man. I was under the influence of that. Even though we learn in school that old, a hymn, and in church too, that the arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. You know that song? Even though we learned that, we still cave to the fear of man. That's the way of, of the curse. So that's what he does. And uh, why he does it, 5C tells us that his heart turns away from the Lord. So he trusts in the flesh and, and material things because his heart turns away from the Lord. And that's basically the heart of his troubles. He just keeps on hiding from God more and more. It's like Adam and Eve in the garden, when they knew they sinned, they ran and hid from the Lord. They thought that was going to fix it. I mean, how naive can you get? But it's very instructive because that's what people continue to do. They continue to feel their exposure and retreat from the Lord. The Lord's the bad uh, power in their mind, and so they hide from him. And that's why they stray away from him. <clears throat> He calls it departing hearts. Their hearts turn away from the Lord. And his end there in verse 6, he is like a shrub in the desert. That probably doesn't mean a lot to us, but that's um, the, the word refers to a low, you know, ground-dwelling kind of shrub. It was green, but it was, wasn't much good for anything. And um, it would grow in hardly any water there on the desert floor. And, uh, and actually, the, the root name of that shrub is, relates to naked. There it sets. And this man is just like that. He's exposed before the eyes of the Lord. He doesn't seem to know it. And uh, <clears throat> he just, he's outside the door 
on the salt ground where he'll never grow until the gospel comes. And there's, a, there's an Easter song that talks about there's no power on earth to keep Jesus in the ground. Here this guy <clears throat> wants to stay in the ground and there's no power on earth that can cover him from the eyes of God. So now we're going to switch over to the blessed man. So the cursed man, what he does, he lives like a man who is cursed. He trusts in man. That's all about man. Why he does it? Because his heart is departed. What's his end? It's like this dead little shrub. And the Lord comes and he says, I know all about you. <laughs> I know all about you. And I want to offer you my son, the atonement for all your sins. We have a great song, All My Hope Is In Jesus. Praise God, my yesterday is gone. There's the core of the gospel. That's what happens when this transition takes place. So now, more shortly, but now listen to verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> Psalm 1, come back to life. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. What does he do? He trusts in the Lord. He believes that God always keeps his promises. He keeps his covenant and that God will, will keep his covenant no matter what happens in our circumstances, that God is faithful even if I'm unfaithful, that God's true even when I'm not true, that God never lets go day after day or night after night. He trusts, that's what he does, he trusts God. Why? Second part of verse 7, watch this closely. It says, whose trust is the Lord. It doesn't say whose trust is in the Lord, although that's also true. But he says his trust is the Lord. The Lord is his life. He's with him, walking side by side, building his life in the Lord, and his confidence is in the Lord. Psalm 90 was my psalm all week, and it says this at the beginning, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, it's one thing to say, I draw courage and confidence from the doctrine. But it's another thing to say, the Lord is my courage. So what can destroy the Lord? Nothing. What can destroy your, your hope? Nothing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is the Lord. So that's what the blessed man, that's why the blessed man trusts in the Lord, because his life is built that way. And what is his end? The beautiful verse, words of uh, verse 8. He is like a tree planted by water. He sends out his roots by the stream. This is, we know all this. He, what, and he doesn't fear when the heat comes, for its leaves remain green. And he isn't anxious in the year of drought for it doesn't cease to bear fruit. That's his end. He's like this tree, the opposite of the shrub creeping along the ground all embarrassed of itself. He's like a tree, and he's set in the best place, and when the heat comes, because it does come in the faithful Christian life, you have heat, and you have misery and trouble and adversity. Like Mr. McShane that I mentioned this morning, short life, he had trouble, but he still thrives, this child of God. And what can you expect? Well, the last part of verse 8, it does not cease to bear fruit. You can expect fruit. It doesn't say a lot of money or a long life or anything like that, but you can bear fruit. Well, what's fruit? Faithful in your prayer life. Faithful in uh, <clears throat> your holiness. Faithful in bringing glory to God. Faithful in the ev evil day. And you can expect that there'll always be a fountain filled with the water of life washing into your life. Those who neglect this are like uh, planted in the dust, uh, but uh, those who are planted in the Lord can expect that the Lord will sustain him. Cast yourself on him, for he cares for you. That's what the blessed man, that's who he is, that's why he is that way, and this is his end. So the your word of encouragement is, which do you want to be like? I've set before you blessing and cursing. Now choose life. And ask yourself for your own benefit and for the benefit of those that love you, where is my trust? 
Do I believe that I'm kept? No matter what, that my life is hidden in Christ, no matter what. As we uh, reach the end of our working career, we start looking at our various investments, you know, Ann and I, <laughs> they are not impressive. <laughs> but they're all over the place, you know, because we lived in New York, South Dakota, here. Every place we'd make a few investments, kind of like squirrels, digging in a hole and hiding an acorn. And so now when we're getting close to retirement, we're wanting to gather up our acorns, if we can find them, and uh, see how they're doing. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, it's interesting to discover that that little symbol it has a deeper reality spiritually. All the little acorns, the deeds of faithfulness, the uh, times of commitment that you've buried, maybe thought nothing was going to come of them, grow up. And in their maturity, they are raised just like, get this, Jesus went to the cross, died, was buried, he ascended. He, he rose again from the dead and he ascended. And he's at the right hand of God. So that when you die, your inheritance is going to be unbelievable because that's what it means to be blessed. I think that's tremendous. That's why we can sing some of the, some of the praise songs and some of the hymns. <clears throat> I know in the, in the, in the uh, past we like this, and we still do. Uh, victory in Jesus, you know. Why can you, why does that make you so happy? Well, because that's your victory in Jesus. Let me read to you part of the last verse. I heard about a mansion that is built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing the old redemption story. And some sweet day, I'll sing up there the song of victory. That's the fruit of the acorn, that victory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight, for this scripture, for the encouragement, Lord, that is so abundant for us in Jesus. And Lord, I thank you tonight, especially for those with a gift of encouragement, these dear souls. Lord, I pray that your reward for them will be, will be vast and great. And I pray that we might all see this as our responsibility as we go through this time of life together to uh, reflect you and your amazing goodness to us and to know, as uh, we're about to sing, that our labor is not in vain. Thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name, amen.
rejoice with the truth for all that is old will at last be made new the vineyards you plant will bear fruit for i am with you i am with you i am with you i am with you you. for i have called you called you by name your labor Your labor 